the, the reason for that is very simple. I have read materials, I have listened to lectures on covenant, but I'm finding that the teachings that uh, are available, even uh, where I've got um, material from some old time professors, very, very deep stuff, it just seems incomplete. And the reason I say it's incomplete, there are sections of it that are missing. Uh, we cannot, for example, understand the major covenants and the intricacies of each covenant. And so when we get to the Mosaic covenant, or the Sinaitic uh, covenant, in order for us to understand that covenant, And from that, in order to understand the new covenant, how Jesus said, I'm come to fulfill the covenant, we have to understand the intricacies, the, the, the depth of uh, the, the Mosaic covenant. Just as we have continuously mentioned and talked about uh, the Abrahamic covenant, we've got to get into the depth of each part of it. And I'm having difficulty finding material where, put to, where put, all of it is put together in one place. So I'm having to gather information from various areas. And part of that was going to be a study today. But I'm going to, I decided to change it so that we may be able to get a deeper study. And part of that is this. In order to understand the Jewish system, the Jewish tabernacle the sanctuary system, we have to intimately understand what happened in the sanctuary and why. Especially because of the background from which I come. The sanctuary is considered the heart of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And any misunderstanding of it comes from not understanding it to the depth that is there. So we can make the mistake and we can take one feast like the Day of Atonement and we can extract from it a doctrine that may or may not be biblical. In order to understand the entire sanctuary service, we have to know what the daily sin offerings were. We have to understand all the seven feasts that the Jews celebrated, the festivals, and when they took place, and what was the symbology behind each of those seven feasts. We can't just lift one out of it and form a doctrine around it. In order to understand it and to justify it, we've got to understand what came before it and what comes after it. So I decided that what we would do is exactly that. I'm going to take you through what was one of my uh, favorite classes doc taught by Dr. Douglas Waterhouse, who I think was the preeminent student of uh, Dr. Siegfried Horn, uh, who was by the preeminent uh, Old Testament scholar of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So the material that we'll be studying comes out of Seventh-day Adventist schools but often gets neglected. And I'm happy to say, and I can proudly say, and I know our, 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 uh, uh, our uh, sermons are, are telecast online, and so this is on the record. That I don't mind saying that Dr. Waterhouse considered me one of his favorite students. I loved his classes, law and writings of the Old Testament. Uh, I still have all of his material, and most of it is available online. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back through what took us several years of learning the sanctuary system. And I want the church and all those that follow us online to understand what the sanctuary was and what the daily and annual feasts were. Because out of that, we can extract the plan of salvation, and in addition to that, we can understand 
what the role of the Ten Commandments were, what was the role of the Ten Commandments was in the tabernacle. The Ten Commandments were there and they were put inside the Ark of the Covenant. Why? And they were covered by the mercy seat. And what does that mean? The entire sacrificial system. And as we go through that, we will then see how Jesus fulfilled the covenant. For us to say he came to fulfill the, the covenant, we don't know what it means unless we know the covenant. So we will spend quite a bit of time, at least seven weeks, on that covenant alone. Then we're going to continue. Now, a quick review. We know that uh, we started with the covenant of Eden, which was found in Genesis chapter 2, where God told Adam that he can eat of every tree, but of this tree he must not eat. And that law was broken. And the covenant was this. That as long as you obey the commandments, as long as you live by the law, you will have eternal life. But your life is, your eternal life is conditional. If you eat of that tree, you will surely die. So that was the first covenant and it was called the covenant of law. Then we have the Noahic covenant. When God made a covenant with Noah, which is an everlasting covenant, we find that in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, God showed him a rainbow and says, Never again will I destroy the world with water. Then we come into the major, what I consider the foundational, not just I, I think most theologians. Uh, I've made a mistake. I, don't, I shouldn't consider myself a theologian. I'm not. I'm just a preacher. Uh, Abrahamic covenant. To understand the scripture, we must know, understand the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic Covenant, chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 18, chapter 22 of uh, Genesis. In which God promises what? Promises him land. He promises him his seed that will be like the stars of the heavens and like the sand of the sea. And then he promises that all nations will be blessed through his seed. And a partial, partial uh, a, a fulfillment of that Abrahamic covenant is then shown in, uh, in uh, the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 19, all the way to chapter 40, where we have the Sinaitic covenant. And the covenant of Sinai, for those that may not know, is about really the possession of the land. The deal that God makes with Moses and the children of Israel was this. That you're going to wander in the wilderness until you are ready. And when you are ready, what will happen? You will possess the promised land. And in Where God said to David, I will bring through you a king whose kingdom will last forever. After that comes the covenant of Jesus Christ, where he says, I am the new covenant. He said that in the upper room. All right? I am the new covenant. This is my blood and this is my flesh. Do this in remembrance of me. So, today I want to focus a little bit more on the Davidic covenant because I don't think we spend enough time on making sure that we understand who Jesus was and what that Davidic covenant was. In chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, David is talking to Nathan. And he says to Nathan, I want to build a house for the Lord. I have a house of cedar. And the Lord has no house. I want to build a house. And Nathan says, yeah, sure, go ahead. This is chapter 7. Verse 3, Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it. For the Lord is with you. Then God talked to Nathan that night. In verse 5. 
And he says, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house and dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from the tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. God is saying to, a, to David, wait a minute, you think that little old David, you're gonna build me a home? No. I am gonna build the people of Israel a home. What is he talking about? Is he talking about the promised land? No. Why? They were already in the promised land. They had already conquered. They had already controlled. They were in charge. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since time I, I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. When does that rest come? Did that rest ever come to the people of Israel? It did not. This is a prophecy, this is a promise of God telling them of an everlasting life and the peace that we'll get in the heavenly kingdom, not the earthly kingdom. Then he goes on and says, Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. This house is not a physical house, it's not a building. This house is like you have the royalty. They have a house right now that the governing house of the house of Windsor, Queen Elizabeth. One day I'll tell you a story about Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip and how Prince Philip's uncle kind of figured out how to bring his family back in control of the throne of England. It's a great story. Not today. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will establish a house. This is talking about a royal house. This is talking about a dynasty. This is talking about a family, not a physical house. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? Forever. I will be what? His father, and he will be my son. I will be his father, and he will be my son. What kind of a home, what kind of a dynasty did Jesus come to form here? An earthly one? An earthly throne? No. But the Jews, the people of that time, expected the Messiah to come and take control of Israel and defeat the Romans and establish an earthly kingdom because they misunderstood the covenant of David and they thought they were going to take back their land. And take back control, get rid of the Romans, and have an earthly home. But God here is talking about a son whose throne will last forever, and there will be peace among the people of Israel forever. Get this. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod, wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands. If this is talking about Jesus... What does this mean? When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men. If you read commentaries on this, you can go through several. I'm going to challenge that almost all of them will say that because this is a parallel prophecy, it talks about Solomon and other kings to come. It, this part is talking about the sins of Solomon that God forgives. We have to be careful. 
We cannot take the Bible and dissect it and change it around whenever we want to, whenever, we suit, whenever it, see, it suits us. We cannot take a passage and say, well, this portion of the verse belongs to Jesus, it's talking about Jesus, but this portion of it doesn't talk about Jesus, so we leave it and we come back to it whenever it suits our interpretation. So what does it mean? This is talking about Jesus, and he says, when he does wrong. When did Jesus do wrong? When? Never. But he says, when he does wrong, I will punish him. And how will I punish him? I will punish him with a rod, wielded by who? Men. That gives away a little bit of a secret. And once again, I'll tell you, you will not find this in most Bible commentaries. Wielded by men. Why is that important? Because this is the son of God. He says, he will be my son and I will be his father. When he sins, he will be punished by a rod which is held and beaten by men, by humans. This is someone who is above humans. who will be put in the hands of humans to be punished for the sins which he becomes guilty of. Not those sins that he committed, but the sins that God put on him on behalf of all of us. So it's as if he did sin. He, Bible tells us what? He became sin for us that we may become righteous like him. But, read this, verse 15. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. God did not take away his love from his son because that son sacrificed himself and gave his life as if he sinned. He became sin for all of us that we may have eternal life. Your house and your kingdom will endure for how long? Before me, forever. Your throne will be established, how long? Forever. Now, we know that the nation of Israel, after Jeremiah, had no king. There was no king for hundreds of years. There was no king, and yet it says, your throne will be established forever. How can that be? That is a prophecy about the coming of Jesus Christ. That when he comes, his throne will in fact be established forever. There's no two ways about it. If you go to Genesis chapter 49, Genesis chapter 49, we find here Jacob has been sick, he's about to die and he knows that his time has come, and he calls all of his sons, and he gives them directions, and he, tell, he prophesies about his sons, that this is what's going to happen to you. And I'm going to skip his talk with his other sons. I'm going to go straight to Judah. Because Judah was the ancestor from whom David came. And through whom Jesus came. Verse 8 of chapter 49 of the book of Genesis. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son, 
Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter, what is a scepter? A scepter is that long golden kind of a stick through which the king either anointed people or people got in trouble. It was a ruling scepter. It was a ruling rod in the hand of a king. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. You get that? Did you get that? Their scepter will not depart until that one, the ruler who belongs to the throne, until he comes and the scepter will be in his hand, until he, he, until he to whom it belongs shall come. And who is he that belongs from the tribe of Judah? It is Jesus. Because he will rule with that scepter for how long? Forever. And get the last line here, of verse 10. And the obedience of the nations shall be his. What nations are we talking about? Do you remember the promise to Abraham? How many nations will be blessed through him? All nations. And the obedience of how many nations shall be in Jesus Christ? The obedience of the nations will be found where? In each person's own, own righteousness? No. The obedience of the nations will be found in Jesus Christ, the ruler. This is the prophecy all the way from Genesis. This is the covenant that God gives to his people. Go with me to Psalms. Reminds me of a Bible study we had in our previous congregation where one of our young people made note of a messianic prophecy. This is another mess. This is the messianic prophecy in chapter 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make you faithfulness, your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever. That you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Now pay attention. Verse 3. You said. This is David now. You said. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line for how long? I will establish your line forever. And make your throne firm through all generations. All generations, forever. This is the Davidic covenant. Although in first, in Second Samuel verse seven, at chapter seven, it doesn't call it a covenant. Here, clearly, he calls it a covenant, a special covenant that he made with David that's going to last forever. Turn with me to chapter twenty-three of Second Samuel. Second Samuel, chapter twenty-three. Verse 5, if my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made with me, what? An everlasting covenant. David, in his confession of his sin, had straightened out all those things that he was held guilty of. And his house was right with God. And God made David a covenant that we find here in chapter 23, verse 5, is an everlasting covenant that people all over the world, every nation of the world, will be saved through his seed, that special king. That special king who is going to be his son. Go with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. There we find Elizabeth has already been told about the baby that she was going to have. 
She's pregnant. She's six months pregnant. And then she goes. She has a visit with Mary. And Mary has been visited by the angel. Verse 26 of chapter 1, the Gospel of Luke. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. It's very important now. Joseph was a descendant of who? David. And who has come to see him? Gabriel. Gabriel. Sorry, he's come to see Mary. The angel Gabriel has come to see Mary. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greetings this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Where did we hear that before? 2 Samuel chapter 7. That he will be my son. The Lord will give him the honor, the, sorry, the, uh, the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. Didn't we read that in 2 Samuel chapter 7? That you will have a son. He will be my son, and I will be his father. And he will be given the throne for how long? Forever. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. His kingdom will never end. This brings us to the conclusion of the promise of God to Abraham. And what was the promise? That you will have seed, and that you will have land, and you will bless all nations. All nations will be blessed through you. Through the Mosaic Covenant, he made sure that they had the land where the seed could prosper. And be safe. And where the system of salvation and redemption can be practiced. And then through the Davidic covenant. The promise of that one seed. Out of many. That would bring salvation to the world. And that seed was Jesus Christ. Through whom how many nations were saved? All nations. It is a lack of proper biblical study. I don't mind saying it boldly. By using proof texting methods for understanding scripture. Now people have developed theology which threatens all humans that they better live a righteous life Otherwise, they're going to go to hell. And the evidence of righteousness is expected to be the living righteousness by the efforts of believers. And yet the Bible tells us there's nothing good in us. Nothing. We cannot of our own effort live a good life. And then we put a crown on our heads and we give ourselves a special number of 144,000. Why? Because we keep one commandment more than the others. And we say, oh, because we keep the Sabbath and the rest of the world doesn't, God is going to take and save us and kill the rest. Not so. If we are taught that we are special because we keep the Sabbath of our own selves or any commandment of our own selves. We're doomed to damnation. 
The only salvation we have is through the grace of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. The Bible tells us that God expects purity. God expects righteousness. But that righteousness, which is the same as God, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. There is nobody that can be as righteous as your Father in heaven is perfect. Only Jesus Christ can. And it is through his righteousness that is given to me that I can stand before God. And Hebrews 6 tells us that we can go into the most holy place boldly. When? Since Jesus went and sat down at the right hand of God. Not in 1844 or some man-made date. We can sit at the right hand. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. And we can boldly go because Jesus, Jesus lived a perfect life. Now, there's no doubt about it that God transforms us with his spirit and before too long we begin to be changed, we're sanctified and that sanctification does not measure by how many of those commandments I keep but how much love do I have for my enemies and for those that are unlovable, for those that are poor. Even when you study the Old Testament, the measure of the law came down to what they did for the widows and the fatherless. That was the measure. That was the measure of God's people as far as salvation was concerned. The fruits of the Spirit. If we think, and if somebody is teaching you that you've got to keep the commandments, then I draw your attention to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus, in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What does that mean? He has come to practice and live the law, not to cancel it. He came to live to fulfill the law. Why? Because I couldn't fulfill it. So he came to fulfill it. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, Anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you can be more righteous. So you want to learn how to keep the Sabbath? They had 613 laws of how to keep the Sabbath. You think you can do that? Come on. Really? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Now Jesus gets really serious. He gets really serious. He says, you have heard, continue, in verse 21. I'm not going to read all of it. I will paraphrase it. About murder. He says, you have heard that you shall not murder. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. So, if my friend, my good Christian law-keeping brother, that is, that, that is organizing your righteousness... If you are angry with your brother, with your sister, with your pastor, with your business partner, you got a problem. You got a problem. The reason Jesus is telling me this is very simple. Is that you can't keep the law. Adultery. But I tell you, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Come on now. Do you know what a high percentage of people would be? 
guilty here? It's a good number. Divorce. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. Oath. Do not take an oath by anything on earth or in heaven. And do not swear by your head for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Verse 18. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn, them, turn to them the other cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand, your, hand over your coat as well. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I said, you love your enemies. How do you stand, my friend? How do you stand, my righteous friend? By what law? In Islam and in Christianity, we hold what's called the doctrine of abrogation. The doctrine of abrogation states very simply that that which came before is canceled by what comes later. Now, Jesus could not change the covenant. Do you know why? No blood covenant was allowed to be changed. You couldn't change a blood covenant. It was there for good. As long as it was required. For example, the covenant with Moses was given for the possession of the land. As a result, that portion of the covenant would not apply. Why? Because they did what they were supposed to do and God did what he was supposed to do. He gave them the land. So there was a time period. Then there's everlasting covenants. Like Abrahamic covenant here with Jesus. Now, when we have these covenants, we cannot change them. But we make a new covenant. We can make a new covenant. That is why Jesus said that a new covenant I give you. A new covenant. And that covenant is this. That through Jesus' death, our debts for sin were paid. Our debts for sin were paid. And because Jesus died, we died in him. And when he was resurrected, we were resurrected in him. When we accept Jesus Christ and when we become adopted into his family, we go from the family of the Federalist Adam to the federal leader, Jesus Christ. And there we become princes and princesses of Jesus Christ. And yes, like the Apostle Paul, we make mistakes, we fall, we sin. And that's why we have communion, that we may renew our relationship with God, that we may confess our sins on an ongoing basis. And as God allows, and as God builds us, through His time and through His power, through His Spirit, He begins to transform us. At no time can we say that I am prepared to be a part of that 144,000 that God is going to come and seal with the Sabbath. There is only one seal. And the book of Revelation is clear on this, by the way. A seal is a seal of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the seal. That is the only seal. We're going to study this further. But in order for us to understand the question of the book of Revelation and eschatology as used and misused, we need to understand the entire scripture 
and the covenants and the role of Jesus Christ and who he is and how we are saved. We're not saved through our works. We don't. We don't keep the law in order that we may be saved through our own efforts. We keep the law because the Spirit of God transforms us. And when the world sees us, and when God sees us, he sees the fruits of that Spirit of God said to, given to us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. If you want to measure your righteousness, if you want to see that mirror, take a look in the mirror and count what you have done for the poor. Those that need your help. Those that cannot give you anything back in return. Don't tell me how righteous you are with your Sabbath keeping, please. You'll hurt your eternal salvation. Talk about how much you love God through how much you live, love the unlovable. That is the measure of God's righteousness. He loved us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We ought to love one another and the unlovable the way Jesus loved us. God bless you and amen.